Turn my boots on and lay some up. So what is public health? There have been a lot of definitions about public health over the years, and the one that I like the best is that public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through organized efforts of society. And it's the part around organized efforts of society that we're going to focus on a little bit moving forward. So in contrast to medicine, where the focus is more on treatment, Public health, by and large, for the most part, focuses really on sort of macro level approaches to how do we prevent and promote health. There are three main goals of public health. They are to protect the population's health and safety, to promote improved health for everybody, and the prevention of the consequences and suffering resulting from disease. The public health system is really complex. When we think about public health, we often think about the government and we think about departments of public health and sort of pieces of the government that build from, from the public health sort of infrastructure that the government supports. The government supports public health at the municipal level, so most in Massachusetts, for example, every city and town has some semblance of a department of public health. Um, that's different from the rest of the country where public health tends to be more county or regionally based. But beyond that, especially in this era of, of reduced government resources, the public health sort of framework and infrastructure really is expanded so that public health by and large is very much out in the community and it's often very coalition focused. So when you think about really who's responsible for, for public health, which is again the societal organized approach to prevention and promotion of, of health and disease prevention, um, there are a lot of players that come to the table. Um, and this includes nonprofit community based organizations. For example, the YMCAs um, are often very integral in public health. We think about our community health centers, our senior centers, our faith institutions more and more are part, of, are part of this. Our treatment facilities are also part of it. Our schools, our work sites. So the public health infrastructure is very loose and it's often self defined within a community. But the key piece in the center is the public health agency. Um, at the national level, the Centers for Disease Control and Public Health is the overseer as well as the funder of a lot of public health. Pu public health funding um, tends to trickle down um, starting mostly with the federal level to the state level to the city level um, and it can go from there to these organizations. But there are a lot of different ways that the funding comes in but the core infrastructure mostly is funded through the CDC as well as state government. The CDC has put out this, um, this graphic that helps us define what the essential um, functions of public health are. Um, and I'm going to, can you hear me when I move? No, you can't hear me when I move. Um, so I just want to make sure I can see this better. <laughs> My eyes aren't good enough to see that. Um, pu public health has nearly 10 key, ten, key func 10 key functions. First is to monitor health overall which is really what we talk about disease surveillance. So when you see on the news, you, you see a lot of public health on the news. X percentage of this population has this disease. That's what we talk about when we mean surveillance. So it's very data driven, it's very quantitative. And there are a lot of um, surveillance systems and, and registries that are available. And actually Sally's gonna, I'm gonna call Sally up and put her on the spot afterwards to show you some of the library resources we've developed at the medical school to, to bring all of this information together. Uh, the second, function of public health is actually to diagnose and investigate. It's to understand what causes what. What are the risk factors or the protective factors for a particular disease? Do, how do we know that um, a certain demographic characteristic or a certain health behavior puts somebody at risk for a particular disease? This falls under this category. The third is to inform, educate, and empower. And in here, the role of public health moves um, really sort of into the advocacy and in the um, the advocacy and the policy development piece where once we know that there's a relationship between a certain risk factor and a certain disease, what do we do about it? And this falls under the umbrella of public health as well. So it's not just simply telling people, hey, don't do this, hey, don't do that, but how do we come up with organized approaches to addressing a problem? And we'll give you some examples of that moving forward. Um, more and more, as I mentioned before, mobilization and community partnerships are increasingly important for advancing the health of the public. Um, our, our government infrastructure is not extensive enough to deal with all of the issues that we have to struggle with as a, as a population in terms of disease prevention and health promotion. 
The policy development piece comes next, and that was where the government uh, beyond the public health infrastructure obviously becomes important, and this happens at the local, um, state, and the, pol and the policy, excuse me, the federal levels. And then here we move into this, this later phase of the, of the circle, which are enforcing the laws once a policy is, is put into place, and then making sure that we can actually link people to resources that we need to. Um, through, through our healthcare systems and other systems. And then the other functions are to make sure we have a, a competent public health workforce. And the public health workforce is in nowadays very broadly defined. Um, it's, there's not a clear definition of what that means, but it's really anybody who works in any realm at all around public health. And then the last piece um, is evaluation. How do we know what we're doing as a society is actually impacting public health? And so the question um, is, where does research come into play in this? This is a lot of different things, and I know I've just very quickly gone through them. And research, as you'll see in this figure, is, is central. It's, it's in the middle. So at the beginning of the circle, the role of research is actually to identify, identify the problems. What are the problems and who's, who's affecting? As we move later on, it's really about how do we identify solutions and how do we test new approaches to making sure that we're addressing the problems that we need to address. And then after that, the role of research is really to evaluate things once they're put into place. So we've done this whole, this whole process of research where we've identified an issue, we've tested some solutions in a research setting, and now we're putting it out there. It's out there. And how do we know that it's really working in the real world? So the role of research then is to evaluate the population impact of these strategies that we're trying to implement. This is a slide um, that in the public health world has lots of versions and that's very, um, very, very common. And the social eco ecological model of health and health promotion is a good one for us to be thinking about what impacts human health. Um, nowadays, chronic diseases are the biggest, the biggest causers of, of health, um, health inequality, disability, um, mortality, morbidity, although there are still other causes of, of of those things. But when we think about what really impacts our health, we often think, you know, really it's, it's, it's what you do as a person, it's, it's, you know, your behaviors, it's how you're operating, and that's certainly a piece of it. Um, but we think about, you know, the individual as a person, and you think about yourselves, and where do you fit? There are so many things around you that influence your health. When we get to this sort of next level, this interpersonal level, your family, your friends, your social situation, what you perceive as your social norms, really impact what you do um, and your health in general. The next is the organizational. So where you live, where you work, where you pray, um, where kids go to school, there are factors there to influence your health in a lot of different ways, some direct, some indirect through the social, through the social ties. The community at large, um, and I'll give a case study of this, affects your health. So the environment in which you live affects, affects your health. And then when we think about society, um, you know, society sort of encompasses all of this, but what I mean by society here is the larger context. It's the culture that we live in. It's our government. Um, it's the media. It's all of these different things that come into play. So when we think about public health, I think we're going to get some examples from our, my colleagues later on that fit into specific places on this about what influences your health. Um, it, it's a really broad, big picture. Um, there are a lot of things that influence health. And I'm going to give some case study, a case study later on that will help us think through this a little bit more. So what are the main public health achievements of the 20, 20th century? The Centers for Disease Control put out these 10 key indicators um, in 1999 that talked about what, what are the things that we've accomplished as a society with respect to health. Most of these are, are infectious disease or safety related. Um, so vaccinations is, was number one on the list. Um, and I apologize to anybody out there who disagrees with things like vaccinations or whatnot, but the, the government really takes credit for, for um, helping save lives um, and improve, improve quality of life. Motor vehicle safety is something we've made a lot of progress on. We don't see the same um, level of, acts of um, disability and um, mortality from motor vehicles than we did earlier in the century. Workplace safety, occupational health. There are core standards in place now that should be protecting people in their workplace. You shouldn't be getting ill when you go to work. Infectious disease control. Simple things like hand washing, um, sanitation, et cetera, um, are major advances. Even though it's still the number one, um, kill, number one killer in, in the country right now, decreased cardiovascular disease mortality is something that's actually improved quite a bit over the 20th century. 
We now are in an environment where we at least have some systems in place to promote healthy and safe foods. It's not perfect, but it's certainly not what it was 100 years ago. Um, maternal and infant health is another major public health um, victory. The rates of infant mortality, of maternal mortality, of effects like that have decreased substantially over the last, I guess, now 113 years. Uh, family planning is viewed as a major public health ac accomplishment. Uh, fluoridation as well, fluoridation of the water. And lastly, tobacco control. Even though it's still pervasive in our country, um, rates of smoking have certainly gone down considerably in the last 100 years, especially after the middle part of the century. And so the leading causes of preventable death nowadays, as you'll see, this is put out by the CDC, what's, what's killing people? Um, and it should be, really even it shouldn't say preventable death, it's really just death in general. Um, what's killing people? Um, nationally, it's heart disease. Here in Massachusetts, the number one cause of death is actually cancer. We're one of the few places in the country where that's true, and that's been true for about five years now, and that's all cancers combined. But for the most part, what we see on this list are chronic diseases. There are still um, you know, some infectious diseases, and then we also see unintentional injury, um, which include things like motor vehicle accidents and suicide on the list, as well as you know, the flu and pneumonia. But for the most part, the big killers, and as well as the big causes of, of disability, reduced quality of life, et cetera, are chronic diseases. And that's because you know, over the last century or two, we've seen such improvements in our control of infectious diseases. People don't, don't die from the flu the way that they used to. They still do, um, but not like it was before. So people are living longer in general, and that, in combination with many other factors, has resulted in an increased rate in chronic diseases as people are aging, and we have other societal forces that are impacting that as well, that we'll talk about in a bit. When we think a little bit about public health versus medicine, I touched on this a little bit before, um, I think that this is an important point, take home point, that it's not exactly the same. Um, in the chronic disease world, there's a lot of overlap between public health and medicine, and sometimes the lines get very blurred. But sort of at their fundamental elements, at their basic principles, there are some key differences between public health and medicine. In a medical environment, as a physician, if I were a physician and I were treating you, you know, my concern is with you. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's about the individual. It's about treating what's best for this person at this time, given their circumstances. And so what happens in medicine is usually you assess the health and the illness status of an individual person. Um, you diagnose their symptoms. You come up with a treatment plan. And whenever possible, you manage any chronic impairments that they have. And that, again, is usually in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Public health, in contrast, and this is sometimes hard for folks to sort of get their heads around, in, the idea is to deal with populations. It's about the health of the population. So things, the easy examples are things like fluoridating the water. Fluoridating the water, whether you like it or not, is impacting you if you're drinking that water. Um, so it's about the overall, the overall thing as opposed to the one-on-one. -on -one. um, public health is often um, geared around environmental protection in some way, shape, or form. And the end result of public health, typically, not always, it's not the whole process, but usually the end result is expected or hoped to be some sort of public regulation or policy that could impact the greater good. And you know, the fluoridation is an easy example, but public health nowadays, because it's chronic disease focused, is much broader than that. So things like health insurance policies, et cetera, could potentially be an endpoint that I'm talking about here in the current, um, the current world. Public health, um, I'm sure you all watch the news and you see all the going back and forth about this idea of national health care reform. And in, if you're living in, if you're from Massachusetts, you're in the midst of it right now. Um, and Massachusetts is maybe about five years ahead of um, the rest of the country with this idea of health care reform. And I'm not going to go into the details of health care reform in any way, shape, or form. But in the context of this talk, one of the, the core elements of, um, I guess I can move back over here now, the core elements of healthcare reform that I think is often overlooked is that the basic, one of the basic premises of why we need to reform our healthcare system, other than the fact that the old system just doesn't work, is to place prevention at the forefront as opposed to, um, as opposed to um, treatment and illness. And there are a lot of reasons for doing that. I couldn't find a, a Credible citation, so I didn't actually put a slide up, but one of the things that you see quoted fairly regularly is that 70% um, of disease is, is something that's potentially preventable, whether it be through lifestyle, et cetera, safety, et cetera, something that could be prevented. But only 3% of the whole public health medical care 
you know, dollars is spent on, on, on prevention. Um, and again, I didn't put that slide up because I couldn't find the source. But that's a huge discrepancy. And, you know, we could, we could debate whether or not healthcare reform, the way that it's structured, is actually going to accomplish that. But one of the goals is to move us a little bit more towards a prevention model. And some of the ways that it's putting public health at the forefront is, first of all, there's going to be um, much greater coverage for things like preventive clinical services. So things like mammograms under the national, um, the national model, for example, will not require a copay anymore. You know, that's something that's prohibitive for a lot of people. So close cl clinical services are required to be covered by everybody for everybody according to, according to accepted guidelines. The other piece um, is funding for public health programs. So at the state level, as well as at the federal level, um, some of the key things that we're seeing nowadays are a lot more funding for tobacco and obesity in particular, which is the theme of our talk today. And I'll talk a little bit about what some of those obesity-related initiatives look like in a little bit. So that, in, in the big picture, um, and, and then there's something that you're probably also hearing in the news called the Prevention Fund, which has been the source of a lot of disagreement and a lot of battling in con Congress. Initially, that prevention fund was designed to put a lot of money and investments into the public health prevention infrastructure. Um, that's not actually happening that way, given all of the budgetary stuff that's been happening, but that was the initial goal of it. Um, so I put this slide up here, Healthy People 2020. Does anybody know what this is? Some of you? Okay, so I put this up here because, it, you know, I was thinking I have a, an audience of librarians. Is there one sort of thing up there that I think you all really need to know about? It's probably Healthy People 2020. Um, and this is, um, comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. Every 10 years, they provide science-based 10-year national objectives for improving the health of all Americans. And these are key indicators um, that really are to, design, to provide benchmarks and to monitor progress over time. And the goal of this really is to, you know, first of all, see where we're doing, but it's designed to really give folks priorities, database priorities for public health in terms of what should we be working on as a society. And the function of these is to encourage collaborations across communities and sectors. We talked a little bit about how inter, interdisciplinary and how complicated the public health infrastructure can be. It's to help empower individuals towards making informed health decisions. And then really it's a measurement tool as well. How are we doing? How do we compare? How do we, how do we compare to the national objectives? In one city, if you're double the rate of what the objective is, you know what, maybe you're a priority city for resources or this is something you really should care about. So that's, that's how that's used. Um, there are many indicators in Healthy People 2020, um, but these are the core domains that are considered the leading indicators, and they relate to health access to healthcare services. Even though we're talking about medicine, it's often a public health issue when you're trying to bring in groups of people who are um, unequally affected by lack of access to health care for many reasons, not just health insurance, but um, things like transportation, co-payments, et cetera. There are a lot of reasons. Um, clinical preventive services, which we talked about briefly, environmental quality. This is less my area of expertise, but the environmental quality in the air that we breathe and the environment we live in is still important. Injury and violence, maternal, infant, and child health, mental health, um, nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, oral health, reproductive and sexual health, the social determinants of health, which is an interesting one. Um, if you're not familiar with this idea, the social determinants of health, when you think about that model that I showed you with the concentric circles, um, the ecological model, when you sort of get out further, those are what we call the social determinants of health, sort of the big picture things that impact an individual's health. Um, as well as there's also sort of a socioeconomic um, element to that as well. Um, and then lastly, substance abuse, which includes tobacco. So those are the core things that our federal government has said. Um, these are the main things that the health of our country needs to be concerned about you know, between 2010 and 2020. And I don't think that these changed all that much since 2000 or even you know, potentially um, 1990. So where does science fit in with all of this? I showed you the, I think I'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. It's really at the center of it. Um, and I don't want to judge this up, but I think it's important to realize that what's happening at our academic, um, at our academic health centers, at our schools of public health and allied health sciences, et cetera, is work that really informs the evidence base for all of these public health investments that we're trying to make. So the role of science is to diagnose, to develop evidence, and then to evaluate it um, in the real world after it happens. So science is really central to all of this, and that's the kind of work that you're going to hear about today.
And the science um, happens at many different levels and it includes many, many disciplines. In the old days, um, epidemiology, which is what I am, I'm an epidemiologist and I did my master's across the street at Arnold House um, a long time ago now, um, used to be considered sort of the basic science of, of, um, of public health, but as we, especially as we've moved towards these broader elements of, of behaviors and obesity and lifestyle and things like that and environmental health, there are just so many disciplines that come into play in terms of providing a scientific base for, um, for addressing public health concerns. And more and more, we're finding at the, at the federal level and even in the way that we work, the work that we do is interdisciplinary. It's not like one scientist from one domain is tackling this issue and another scientist from that domain is tackling that issue. People work together recognizing that you know, the uniqueness of their training and focusing on a team-based approach to science is really the only way to come, uh, come up with solutions to these really complex health problems that we're facing. So for example, um, my colleague Sherry in the back in, in the green, hi Sherry, is a psychologist and we have our own unique trainings and our own unique skill sets, but we're still addressing, you know, we collaborate on different projects and we work on the same things because no one scientific training in this day and age is gonna ever be sufficient to address the public health issues that we have. So, you know, this, the more traditional schools of public health have things like epidemiology and biostatistics and health education and environmental health and health policy and management, but we also, in our allied health schools, have nutrition and exercise science, the social and behavioral sciences, because especially as we're thinking about you know, health behaviors and tobacco and obesity and nutrition, physical activity, and even things like wearing a seatbelt, there are inherent behavioral and social aspects to that. So more and more we recognize that we need to be working together as scientists. Um, and I didn't even include, um, as part of this talk, the role of the community in science. That's a whole other talk that I could do. Um, but they're also potentially part of this world as well. So I talked about that. And this is just my, my epidemiology pulp plug. <laughs> Um, this is a definition that I like about epidemiology, which is the, the study of the distribution and determinants of, it's a little wordy, um, health-related states in specific populations and the application of the study to control health problems. So what kind of questions um, and methods do we use in public health? They're, they're widely varied. Um, most of our public health work, not all of it, involves actual humans. But not all of it. Um, you know, the air quality stuff is not necessarily require humans, but it could. Um, but for the most part, you know, we, we care about people. Um, we don't work with rats. We don't work with, you know, cell lines or anything like that, um, which is probably in contrast to some of the other talks that you've heard at these library boot camps. Um, and the first role of, of our research questions is really to describe. You know, what is the prep, what we call the prevalence? How, what percentage of people in a given population have a condition? Um, or a risk factor, and how do you how do you do that? And and there's a there's a whole level of complexity about how you do that accurately. How do you get at the right population? How do you have the right measure? How do you know that when you're talking about the rate of depression in your population, that's really what you're measuring? So the science of that involves those sort of basic questions about how do you really truly understand what's happening in a population. The next is what we call analytic, and the analytic work usually is about recognizing what risk factors are. What's a risk factor for the disease? How did we find out that tobacco was uh, causing lung cancer? You know, there are a lot of different methodologies to being able to do that, but that's the kind of question that we want to answer in an analytic study. What is, uh, I'm trained not to use the word cause, but what is associated with what? What leads to what? What is contributing to what condition? And those tend to be um, large, large studies that involve a lot of people. They're very quantitative in nature. They're not experimental, but it's really observing associations using, um, going back to our multidisciplinary list, things like biostatistics to help us uncover those associations. The next kind of method that we use are experimental and quasi-experimental. Sorry, Andrew, can you just back up a little bit from just because that's really sensitive. Okay, so it's, okay can that, you hear me? Can you still okay? hear me? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, experimental and quasi-experimental. Um, and so you've probably, I mean, I'm guessing in some of your boot camps, you've learned about what a clinical trial is. Um, clinical trial is a piece of this, but it's actually a little bit beyond that. We're not really talking about always testing whether or not a drug works. It could be testing whether or not a program in the community works. Um, Sherry's gonna be talking about an intervention later on. 
So there are a lot of different ways that we evaluate things. You know, we could be evaluating whether or not a policy works, um, et, et cetera. So there are a lot of different ways that we can sort of think about experiments that aren't really true um, clinical trials. And then the last piece, which is not at all my area of expertise, is there's a whole methodology behind disease investigation. So there's still an arm of public health that is concerned with why is there a salmonella outbreak? How do we get to that? How do we get to the root cause? How did they figure out that it's all coming from one processing plant in the Midwest? Um, so there's an entire scientific discipline behind that. I'm starting to take too long. So I'm going to sort of quickly um, walk through, using some of the things that I've introduced, the idea of obesity as a public health problem, to give some illustration. Um, this is a figure of what's happened in our country according in, in different age groups with respect to, um, this is overweight and obesity, not just obesity. What are the, what's the rate? The word that we use is prevalence. What's the prevalence of overweight and obesity in our population? And as you can see, there were some really sharp increases um, between you know, the 70s and even before up through um, 2000s. And there's been a slight leveling off lately, but it's still kind of gradually increasing. And among our adult population, um, two-thirds of the population nowadays is considered overweight or obese, and one-third is considered obese. Um, we can focus really more on obesity because there's some conflict of evidence about what harm actual just being overweight has on your health, but certainly there are very clear indicators that being obese um, is, is obviously very negative for many, for many reasons. And then even in our kids and people um, in general, the public, tends to get outraged when things hurt our kids. And so one of the reasons that I think that the obesity epidemic is, is sort of taken off as it is in terms of people really wanting to care about it and do stuff about it is because of the impact that it's having on our children. Um, and so 10%, almost 10% of our two-year-olds are considered overweight and obese. And this is a number that just keeps, it's just gonna keep on going up unless we come up with some population strategies as well as some clinical strategies to reduce this. And that's why we're all doing the work that we're doing today. Um, so what are the consequences of, obes of obesity? Well, the physical health ones are things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, some types of cancers, musculoskeletal diseases, respiratory diseases, reproductive issues, among others. These are just the most common ones. It also affects well-being. Uh, obesity is, is, has a sort of comorbid relationship with things like depression, decreased quality of life. It affects your physical function, and there's also evidence that suggests, especially in later life, it can impact your cognitive function as well. And then there are costs, and the government always cares when there are costs involved. And it's really hard to quantify really what, what's the number, you know, how many dollars does this cost us, and there's no perfect answer to this by any, any stretch of the imagination. But the number that's most well accepted now is that it costs, in terms of just direct medical costs through all of these different conditions, um, about $90 billion a year in our country, um, and that's 10% of all medical costs, and it's something that's affecting our, our young people as well as our old people. And then there's also an indirect cost to obesity. Um, I do some work in the area of worksite health promotion, and one of the indicators is that we know that folks who, who have, um, who have you know, severe issues with their weight potentially experience things like lost productivity and lower wages, et cetera. And then sort of on top of all of this, there's still a stigma. Even though it's something that affects, in some way, more people than it doesn't, um, there's still the stigma to it. Um, and there's sort of, a, sort of a blaming the victim kind of, kind of mentality. So it's really you know, very complicated. And so this is a different version of that, um, that slide that I had showed before with the circles, where we think about really what's impacting um, obesity. Um, I'm not a geneticist, and there are clearly some genetic factors and some individual factors beyond the individual's control um, that impact somebody's weight, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'll acknowledge that that certainly is important, um, but it's not where I'm going to go with this talk. And when we think about from a lifestyle perspective, um, what are the factors that influence obesity? Well, you know, it's behavior. Calories in, calories out, calories in, calories out. That, that's, that's the key piece to it. And what affects calories in, calories out? Um, and how do you change calories in, calories out? That's where the science comes in. Those are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer when we think about how are we going to tackle this issue um, of, of obesity as a society, as a country, and, as, and globally now as well. So I just sort of broke the rest of my talk down um, into, you know, what do we 
you know, not, not all of this evidence is as, as solid as some of the others, but when we think about these layers, what do we know in terms of what the risk and protective factors are, and what are our intervention strategies? What is science telling us works, or what is in the works in terms of, of the science to be able to do this? Well, from the individual perspective of you, you know, sort of here as a, as a person, um, things like knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, um, what we call self-efficacy, which is, is, is sort of like your confidence in your ability to do things like make good decisions and to go work out and be good at the gym, et cetera. And then there are certain behavioral patterns, um, and there are lo there's lots of evidence about things that matter in terms of weight control, in terms of how you eat. And when we think about what the associated strategies that help us deal with that, um, it's behavioral weight loss interventions, and I may get in trouble for having a Weight Watchers logo up there with their permission, but it's things like... It's, uh, <laughs> You know, it's things, it's things like what you learn at Weight Watchers. How do, you, how do you monitor what you're doing and how do you really pay attention to what's going into your body and what you're doing in a way that helps you, um, you know, balance that, that or shift the calorie and balance the other way. So that's stuff that you probably all are, are fairly familiar with. When we think about our relationships um, and, or interpersonal factors, it, this could be your spouse, your child, your coworker. You have everybody has their own social network that's defined unique to you. It could be folks that you've never met online. You know, your social network is your social network, and that's one of the things that makes it kind of hard to think about how do we address social networks um, from a scientific perspective. But your social networks help and they hurt you. They can support you. They're either just generally or very directly around the way that you eat. If you go to your grandmother's house, like I do, and she lays out 800 pounds of junk food in front of you every time you go over, that's not really helping me. <laughs> um, and which leads to the second piece, which is social undermining. People that either intentionally or unintentionally can undermine what you're trying to do. Um, I don't know what your libraries are like, but I know that at certain workplaces, when you go in, there's one person who likes to bring in donuts every day. Um, and if you're trying to lose weight, even though that person is trying to be helpful, maybe they're undermining you. Um, and then there are just sort of general social norms. Um, you know, every family has its own traditions. Everybody eats in their own way. Um, there's a, a scientific evidence out there that shows that you tend to be friends with people who have similar body shapes to you. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why that may be. So, so your relationships matter from that perspective. And this, in terms of the science, in terms of addressing it from this um, perspective, is really growing. It's less well-developed than individual-level approaches. But what we're seeing are things like family-based approaches. How do you intervene on a family? How do you help a whole family? How do you sort of get in through the mom to help them understand what's happening about the way that she food shops and cooks that affects her kids? Um, group-based approaches, where we work with entire groups of people who maybe they're natural groups or they're groups that are put together. Um, social media approaches are, are coming up more and more. And then this last one, I don't know if your worksite has ever had this, but things like challenges and competitions. How do you bring groups together at a worksite, for example, and let's all lose 100 pounds together and we all jump on the scale, that sort of stuff is what you see. And those aren't things that really just popped up. There's some sort of a scientific base behind all of that. Um, when we think about our community, um, I sort of separated here. I've sort of shifted from just obesity, really, to physical activity and nutrition here. When we think about physical activity and the physical activity environment, um, it's a term that we use is built environment. How does the built environment that you live in impact your physical activity? So things like the way your community is designed. Um, are, there, are there sidewalks in your area? Are, is it safe? Is it a crime-riddled area? Um, are there recreational opportunities available to you? Um, the impact of these are potential, you know, you know, they're small, but they're consistent. And a lot of places where we live, except for places like Boulder, Colorado, and Oregon, are not really designed in this day and age to promote people to be active. We all rely on our cars. And so this um, little picture on the bottom, um, for anybody who's from Worcester, that's an aerial view of Kelly Square in Worcester, which if you know Worcester, you know that it's awful. It's like the worst place in the world to try to walk, even to drive. It's, you, you just like go with blinders and just go. <laughs> Um, it's really awful. Um, and then there are actually, there, there's been a lot of investment, or there is a lot of ongoing investment at the state and the national level around the built environment um, and physical activity. And in Mass and Motion, there's a campaign called, I mean, in Mass and Motion, in Massachusetts, there's a campaign called Massachusetts, which is one of the governor's um, key initiatives around obesity. It's, it's administered through the Department of Public Health, but 
all sorts of other funders have come into play. And something like 60 communities in Massachusetts now are considered mass in motion communities. They're mostly the larger communities. They're mostly the more underserved communities. But a part of this is really around building capacity to make these built environment changes. Some are small, some are little. Some are as simple as adding bike lanes. Um, some are as simple as cleaning up parks and bringing new equipment. Some are much more complex about building, you know, initiating new policy standards for you know, having to do certain things whenever you want to put up a new building or whatnot. Um, so that's happening here in Massachusetts, and we're actually a leader um, across the country in this because what's followed is that the federal government, um, through this health care reform, put out these things called community transformation grants that are going to communities all over the country now to start on this. And so Massachusetts is really kind of leading the way around this. Um, and, and they're doing similar kinds of things around the nutrition environment. And when you think about the environment and nutrition, we think about a few key things. Can you access it? Is it available? And what does it cost? So. You know, if you look down here, that's what a grocery store in many places look like. When you go into the inner cities, that's all you see. Um, more and more, um, we're moving towards trying to bring healthy foods to people. Um, things like, um, or safe routes to school should have been on the other slide, I'm sorry. Um, you know, things like farmers markets, urban gardens. Um, there's been a big push towards really getting this stuff out there. It used to be that this was a way to support the farmers, and it's still a really important way to support the farmers, but now we recognize that, you know, cities like places like Detroit, um, for example, are just known they don't have supermarkets. How do, you, how do you build the infrastructure to make this available, and how do you make it affordable? And so the Let's Move campaign at the national level um, is, a, is a good idea, a good initiative um, that models some of this. Um, and when we think about society, what are the things <laughs> that um, we're up against? You know, the food industry um, is beyond anybody's comprehension in terms of how much money they have and how far-reaching it is. And, and that's hugely detrimental to the health in many ways. Um, we have this massive reliance on automobiles. Our systems and our society just doesn't support it. Um, added on to that is that we have a health insurance uh, a, you know, payment system that supports disease treatment, but not prevention. So for example, you can get almost any disease treated, but you can't pay to, you know, it's very hard to get reimbursed to be in a good weight loss program, et cetera. So how do you intervene on this? And this is a great question because I don't have the answer. Um, certainly potential federal regula regulations, I don't know what it looks like, um, but that's really what you can do. Um, and so that's my big pie in the sky illustration of what public health is. <laughs> I know I threw a lot out at you, but I know I'm also running out of time here. Um, and so I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, this is my favorite cartoon. This came out in the New Yorker right after, um, right after um, our, what was it, the anthrax scare? And it's two people at a cocktail party and the lady saying to the other, and it was so typically brilliant of you to invite an epidemiologist. I love that cartoon. <laughs> so thanks. Any, any questions or points of clarification? Yes. Sally, can you come up here? Uh, was that sort of behind, um, I heard not too long ago that certain inner cities use like Walgreens or certain mm -hmm. dairy fresh fruit? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so even some of the big retailers are starting to get on board. So the, the question was um, related to the idea of nutrition environment. And she mentioned that she had heard that in some inner cities, places like Walgreens are starting to sell fresh fruits and vegetables and things like that. And you're seeing things like that pop up here and there. Um, if you're looking for a good resource, last summer um, HBO came out with a series, a video series called The Weight of the Nation. Um, and if, as a library, if you're looking for anything to support um, in terms of just getting the word out about some of these issues, we did that last year um, at UMass um, and in other places throughout Worcester to show some of those videos. Um, there are longer versions and shorter versions, and there are several series with different themes. But those are actually really, really well done. Um, so that gets at some of that. How does the food system and how are, how are people helping? How are we dealing with it? Can we get online? So my question to Sally is, can we get online? Because I would like, at least at some point, if not right now, to just show you the LibGuide that Sally has developed for us at this medical school that really brings together lots of key um, public health resources, things like where can you get local data, statistics, what are these surveillance systems, et cetera. Can we do it at the end? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Great okay. Yes, in the back. Yeah. 
so so the the question was how much influence is there on addressing kids um, in middle school as a verse as a verse opposed to just tackling um, parents and so I think from the, I think there's both from the science perspective um, one of the things that I didn't mention is a lot of this work happens in settings like work sites and schools and community organizations there's just a whole wealth of what works of stuff out there and early on the studies in childhood obesity really went after schools first and they did it without going after parents and so we didn't see a lot of success in those interventions and so I think now it's moving more towards family under the recognition that you can't isolate you know you can't have a kid be in a school and be expected to have, and, and one of the good things that's come out of this is the re, um, a renewed emphasis on school lunch standards and the foods and the things that are available in schools. Um, so that's a good outcome, but that in and of itself doesn't necessarily going to, you know, it's not going to cure things. It's not going to solve the problem by itself, even though it's important, it needs to be there. So there was an early research emphasis on that. From that, we've seen lots of initiatives, things like um, what I call the Safe Routes to School, which are initiatives that are happening to help kids walk to school safely, things like taking out sugar-sweetened beverages in schools, et cetera. So those things are happening, but we didn't see the, the weight outcomes from those initiatives in and of themselves, which has led really now towards really realizing we maybe missed the, missed the mark a little bit in the families and the parents, especially moms, and most families, not all, need to be a part of this, and it needs to be broader than that. Yes? Okay. Sure. But in relation to empowering young people to take um, action around mm -hmm. health, um, how it how does like the public health world interact with school curriculum? Sure. With school curriculum, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, and I'm not really, there are probably isolated examples of, of integrating health into school curriculum, but I'm not aware of anything that's really systematic around that. Um, in some places, I know, for example, in Worcester, there are strong youth coalitions. Um, so one of the things that happened in Worcester is that there's a coalition called the Hope Coalition that's um, made up of, teen, of high school kids, and they la lobby and they tackle things. And they did a thing a couple summers ago where they really lobbied the city government to get tobacco out of the pharmacies. And they passed an ordinance. You know, it was led by the kids. And then, of course, the tobacco lobby came in. And you know, it's not 100% settled yet. But you know, there is definitely power of youth um, in that. But in terms of integrating it into the school curriculum, I think that that's a great idea. Um, but I'm not really. There may be things out there that I'm not aware of. In terms of who funds the CDC, um, the CDC is part of the Department of Health and Hum Human Services at the federal le level. So Congress funds it. Those those decisions come from Congress. Um, what's happened lately is sh <laughs> Congress has just cut the CDC. <laughs> Their budget has been decimated um, in the last couple of years. Um, but there's kind of there's there's some framework that the CDC director has a lot of input, as does the director of the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's a rep it's a very typical political process where there's a lot of go back and forth about what happens in terms of those decisions and how they're made. When it comes to how you fund folks, it's very similar to the NIH. Um, it's grant-based. Um, so if a state wants to get con um, CDC funding, there's usually a call for applications, and they have to submit a grant, and it goes through some sort of a review process um, in terms of how the money is trickled down. But in terms of what, how the priorities are set and how the money initially goes into CDC, that's very much a political process. And I had a hand over there earlier. No? Yes? Mm -hmm. They're very large things like the reduction in recess hours. Mm -hmm. and yes. The reduction in mm -hmm. And even larger one that only indirectly affects perhaps the obesity problem, but probably has a distinct effect on it, which is the scheduling of school hours yep. where the youngest students are going to school later and the yep. older students can be more free. Right? Yes, you're absolutely right. So there's been more success on the nutrition side in schools than there has on the physical activity side. and. The hard part about that is that you're even getting resistance in some cases from principals, teachers, and superintendents because they're held accountable to a different standard, um, which is education standards and test scores and things like that. And they say, how can we possibly fit this in when you want me to do this? So there's been no way to resolve that yet. Um, and I absolutely agree with you. I think the, the most difficult thing to accept about all of that is that there's very clear data that indicates letting kids be physically active in the middle of the day and giving them breaks improves their performance. And that data is pretty clear, but nobody's paying attention to it. 
So I think that you're absolutely right, and I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> yes? Um, I was curious about the role of, of the public health with regards to the larger corporations that mm -hmm. get into, into, um, into specific areas. Sure. Like, which leads to that particular sure. epidemic. Sure. So, 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 so an example specifically with the one around New York City and the protests. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how does corporate America fit into that? Well, I know how corporate America fits <laughs> in terms of like how does, how does yeah. policy, yeah. right, and government get involved or public health get yep. involved with their regulating? Yeah, so, so that's challenging because corporate America is always going to have, you know, a million times more money than, than public health has, and that's really what we're up, up against. It's a really complicated political process. Um, what you see are sort of like sort of blaming the things like McDonald's, you know, nowadays has these wonderful play areas. They're promoting physical activity, <laughs> um, which is great, but they're still selling, you know, a lot of the same stuff. And then there are, you know, ways around it and the marketing campaigns are almost impossible to keep up with. So I think it's just, there's so much money and there's so much complexity and they have, you know, they know how to market things better than we do, than we ever probably will be able to. So it's just, it's really complicated for a given, you know, if I'm a mom with a bunch of kids and I'm going to the grocery store, um, there's so many factors competing against me. One of which is that my kids want the bright colored things with all the packages. Another is that it's convenient. Another is that they make the labels and the marketing so complicated it's hard to figure out what's what. Um, so it's really, um, I, there's, there's no answer that I'm aware of to that at all. Um, and a great way to learn more about that, as I mentioned, was those Weight of the Nation videos that I talked about that did a really good job of, of uncovering some of those issues. How are we doing? Are we at time? Let's do one more. One more question? Oh, wait. Okay. There's one more right here. Okay. Um, well, I was just wondering, like, what kinds of, like, actual measures of these kind of public health um, values, like depression values, mm -hmm. or nutrition, or Sure. Assessment? Okay, so um, so from the national perspective, there are many surveillance systems that are um, administered through the Department of Health and Human Services, in some cases through the CDC, in some cases through a group called the National Center for Health Statistics, and then there are others as well. And I think we have a lot of, do we have some of that on our uh, LibGuide? So there's some key, some key surveillance systems. One is called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which monitors year by year um, trends in things related to risk behaviors. Um, there are systems, there are national surveys, things called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is um, a smaller study, but it's much more in-depth, and it actually goes into people's homes, and it takes their blood pressure, and it draws their blood, and it, it's much more in-depth. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot out there on those. Those are probably the two major ones for the areas that I've talked about, but there's a lot out there. Um, and I think we have some of that on our website um, that Sally's put up, so when we, if we have time, if not, we can just email you the link yeah. later. Um, yeah. Yes. So everyone can just take a quick look. And I'm not sure. I think we did a pretty comprehensive job on that. Um, and then there are places locally in Massachusetts. Um, the Department of Public Health has a resource called CHIP. It's a little bit more difficult to access. Um, but they have city, town specific information, um, or at least regional state information that you can access. Um, so on our, our LibGuide, we have sort of local, local you know, state and national sources of information. And that's data that already comes in aggregate form in many cases, and it's also data that could potentially be accessed by a researcher to ask more complicated questions in it. Okay, oh, we do have one more. Should I? All right, last one, last question. Um, so I, I'm interested in incarceration and how that affects mm -hmm. public health. Okay. That's a, that's a great question, um, and I don't have a clear answer. I can tell you that in many of the data systems that I've talked about, those populations are excluded. 
they're, they're typically excluded. Um, there's probably a small world out there that's very research focused on the health of, you know, how incarceration impacts health, but it's typically not when we get to the level of what our public health infrastructure is investing in, it's probably not front and center. So it's more focused on like going up consecutively. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah.